own who you are. Don't change who you are, or don't change who you into someone you think you should be to please yes. others to do the thing. I really think to to show up and live your life authentically that you have to be just that authentic. I knew the risk, but I let the love for my child mm. and my and my and my trusting my intuition. I allow that to move me through what I was being told with heart in all aspects of life, including the workspace. It, it should not be taken out of the workspace. Um, it's being authentic and putting yourself out there, knowing that you will be criticized. It's standing up for what you believe in to be right when everybody around you tells you that it's wrong, and it's listening to your own intuition over the experts or the noise of the world. Today's guest is Tracy Ferrin, the best-selling author of Up Struggle, a motivational speaker, content creator, the host of Rock Your Kindness podcast that is presented by Love What Matters and a proud cancer thriver. Across all platforms, she has over 670k followers with TikTok being the largest she uses her platform to have fun, be a real model, and give back. With the help of her TikTok community, she has raised over 40 k for a Wendy's employee and 90 k for a man who needed heart surgery. She is also the creator of Wish List Wipeout. Tracy is married to her best friend Ryan and together they have four children and one grandchild. Houston, Texas is where she calls home. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversations. So after reading that out, can you possibly pick what is one of the most courageous things you have done? Oh, goodness. One of the most courageous things I have done um, is go against my doctor's advice. Uh-huh. When um, I was pregnant and diagnosed with cancer, mm-hmm. um, and they uh, advised me to abort, and I said no because Ooh. they had, you know, this was in '01, so in '01 they didn't have research on women being pregnant, undergoing chemo in their mm-hmm. first or second trimester mm-hmm. that delivered a healthy baby. So oh, this was over 20 years ago. Um, so I'd have to say that's probably the most courageous thing that I have done. Yeah, definitely, for sure. When you've been advised due to your own health and you were carrying, you were pregnant, carrying a baby, mm-hmm. very courageous, bold move as well, to be honest. <laughs> yes. Well done that you did do that. So what took you on your journey of being a motivational speaker? Was this something that fell into place or is this from your experiences? Like I said, I was pregnant. I was married. I had already had a 10 month old when I found out that I had cancer and you know, my doctors were like, you know, you need to abort. And I said, no, I dug my heels in. Mm -hmm. And I actually go to my doctors and I'm like, look, I have the plan. You listen to me. I'm going to tell you how this is going to (laughs) go. I'm like, so let me just finish my pregnancy, which I was, I think I had three more months, right? I was 16 to turn to my third trimester. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'll finish my pregnancy. I'll have a healthy baby. And then, and then we will deal with this cancer stuff. I'll do treatment, whatever you want me to do. How does that sound? And he's like, yeah, that's not going to work because that Mm. literally was the difference of life and death for me because I had Mm. an aggressive cancer that spreads pretty rapidly left untreated. Um, And with that that type of cancer, once it spreads usually to the lungs, there's not a whole lot more that they can at that time that Mm -hmm. they can do once it goes there. And thankfully, it hadn't spread. Um, But three months, it very well could have. Um, So it was, but I still told him, I understand what you're saying, but you need to understand what I'm saying. It's just not going to happen. I'm sure there's a a different way, a different thing we can come up with, Mm -hmm. a different solution. And so he consulted with, you know, other doctors about a different uh, approach to my situation and and care and treatment. Mm -hmm. And he came to me and said, okay, how does this sound? Um, We can wait till you're in your third trimester and then we'll start chemo because the research shows that once a woman is in our third trimester, the baby's pretty much developed 
it's just okay. the baby needs to just put on more weight. Mm-hmm, and with mm-hmm. chemo being poison, um, if I could just let my baby get past that development stage, right? Because who knows mm-hmm. what chemo would have done in the first or second trimester. Um, and he says that it kind of gives, he's like, I can't guarantee like that she'll be healthy. I can't give you any guarantees. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, this is what the research shows. Let's wait till third trimester. So I actually did chemo with her. Wow. Um, I waited, it was just three weeks. I waited three weeks, hit my third trimester. I was scheduled to have my first treatment and go into the hospital on 9-11-01. And of course, here in the U.S., that was a very pivotal day for us. Um, mm. You know, while our country was under attack and going to mm. be going to war, in some ways, I was under attack and fixing yeah. to go to war um, and so be- because of those horrific events I they did delay my chemo a day because nobody knew what was going on um so it wasn't until the next day that I actually got admitted and started my treatment started my treatment everything's fine I'm feeling fine but everyone's looking at me like I'm an injured puppy and like something's wrong and I'm thinking y'all it's not a big deal like I feel fine <laughs> um of course I was young and I don't know the reality of cancer, which played in my favor, believe it or not. I really believe that that yeah. played in my favor of how optimistic I went into it. Now, tell me I have cancer. I will be a hot mess because I know <laughs> the reality of it. Um, mm. So I do my first round of chemo with my baby. She's, I'm pregnant and I go home. I think it was the first day or two of being home and my husband leaves, realizes he just can't do it and, and he leaves. And it was so hard. But when you're in survival mode and it's life and death, Mm -hmm. I didn't have a whole lot of time to focus on that, right? I'm trying to save my life. I'm trying to save my baby's life. Like I've already got a toddler. Like I just, I can't put a whole lot of energy on it, but I was heartbroken. And so moving forward, I do a few more rounds of chemo. Now the the next two rounds of chemo that I do with my baby, they, it pushed me into uh, labor, preterm labor. And okay. so after, after chemo, they'd have to ship me across the street, put me full of magnesium to stop, you know, cause it was just too early. She couldn't come that early to okay. stop contractions. Then I, you know, could go home anyway. So that <laughs> happened twice. Wow. Um, and then finally they're like, okay, we can take her. We feel confident taking her six weeks early without any major complications to being a preemie. Cause they didn't want her going through too much chemo with me. Mm-hmm. Um, but they didn't want to take her but they didn't want to take her too early so it's like okay six mm-hmm. weeks it all it all makes sense and um so there I am in the hospital giving birth and which by the way I've had four kids and she was probably the easiest I mean like a sneeze because she was so <laughs> tiny she was so oh. tiny but there I am in bed like as bald as Mr. Clean giving birth we don't know what to expect we really truly believe that she would come out being hairless, that she would be bald. They were concerned about the development of her lungs being a preemie, but they did give me steroid shots to help develop them. But we Mm -hmm. just had no idea. Again, no research. We don't know. Am I going to deliver an alien? We're not sure. (laughs) Um, So I I literally, I push her out and she comes out screaming at the top of her lungs with a head full of hair, with body, her body is covered with hair. And we all just kind of, because my, my sister was there, my parents, the doctors, Aww. my brother-in-law at the time was there. And we all just start making eye contact like, okay, she's going to be fine. Yes. Right? She's screaming. She's screaming, which means her lungs are developed. That was our mm. biggest concern. And she's not bald. So how does that happen, right? How is it that mom's bald? If I'm getting chemo, surely she's getting chemo. And she has, I mean, like a ton of hair. So there was really, there was, there truly really wasn't anything wrong with her. She was just tiny. Um, and they can't send a three pound, 10 ounce baby home. And so she did have to stay in the NICU, but she had to stay in the NICU just so she could put weight on. Yes. Um, and so once she got to five pounds, they did let her come. I mean, still tiny, but mm-hmm. five pounds, she could mm-hmm. come home and she stayed in the NICU for about a couple of weeks. Now, when she was in the NICU, I didn't get to visit her a whole lot. Because Mm -hmm. my wonderful doctor gave me a week off from having a baby and then hit me with chemo again. So I didn't. Wow. I I did. I wasn't. I was in one hospital and she's across the street at another hospital. But thankfully, my family did go visit her daily and love on her. 
Um, and so she goes home and I do one more round of chemo after having her, but then I have to have my surgery. So I have my leg surgery that is to salvage my leg. Now, when I, um, before I went into surgery, they're like, there's no guarantees. We can't tell you if we're going to have to give you a knee replacement. We can't guarantee that you can keep your leg because with osteosarcoma, a lot of people do lose their limbs. Um, so there was just no guarantee. I could have woken up and not had a leg or mm -hmm. had a knee replacement and a knee replacement at that young of an age. They're mm -hmm. like, we don't want to have to do that because you'll have to have multiple knee replacements throughout your life. And the older you get, the harder it will be. Yeah. Um, but so fortunate that one, I kept my leg and I did not need a knee replacement. So I do my surgery about 13, 15 hours. I'm in the hospital and it's right before Christmas. And now my daughter was already home from the NICU when I'm in the hospital recovering from leg surgery. Mm -hmm. And I keep asking my doctors, can I go home? Do you know when I can go home? They're like, I don't know. Because Christmas is, is fast approaching. <laughs> and they're like, we're not sure. Let's just give it another day. We need to make sure, you know, you can pee on your own. You can get a bed on your own. Like, I have to hit all these milestones before they want me to go home. And every day I'm like, okay, can I go home? Okay, I'm doing this. Can I go home? And the answer was always, we're not sure. Okay, we really don't think you're quite ready. Look. I don't think you understand me very well. I might be asking, but now I'm telling you oh. that with or without your permission, I will be going home mm -hmm. for Christmas to spend mm -hmm. it with my daughter. And reluctantly, they went ahead and released me Christmas morning. Um, they're like, okay. Because I was, like, was going to walk out one way or another. I was going to get home to spend Christmas with my two girls. So I go home. You know, it was great. We bring in the new year. Now, the new year brought lots of complications. And mm -hmm. first of all, being on, having my leg surgery, I had to be on crutches. Mm -hmm. So I've got two babies pretty much. I'm mm -hmm. sick as can be. I'm on crutches. There's not a whole lot of independence for a woman like that. And they're like, you need to be on crutches for a year because I couldn't put weight on my leg. Because when you're sick with cancer and you do chemo, your body heals a lot slower. Mm -hmm. than the average person. And if I put weight on my leg too fast, I could have broken it. And they mm -hmm. actually have someone who did that, that had the same surgery as me, that did that, and they ended up having to amputate his leg. So they were like, this is very serious. Mm -hmm. So I'm on crutches. And, you know, the, the surgery itself was extremely painful. I'm emotionally distraught because my husband left me. I've got these two mm -hmm. kids and a, a preemie baby. And I am so honest and transparent when people are like, well, how'd you deal with it? I'm like, well, I did it. You know, let me tell you what I did. <laughs> um, I started abusing my pain meds because over 20 years ago, they gave me a hundred pill bottle. I mean, I had a hundred pills, big bottles oh, of wow. hydrocodone. You, mm. that's not heard of these days. You get no, like, no, not at all. Right? No, you get like 20 after surgery. And if you're still in pain, you have to request like five more. Yes. Um, so things were different back in the day, but that was the only way I didn't have a whole lot of tools in my toolbox mm -hmm. to cope. And that was really the only way I realized, of course, I took it for the physical pain, but mm -hmm. I realized that it made me just relax, feel better, easygoing. I, there was no care in the world. And when I realized that the pain pills did that for me, I was starting to use them more for than just physical pain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I dealt with things like mouth sores all up and down my yes. throat again, a lot of pain that they were so painful that I did not want to eat or drink. Well, people that are on chemo are already losing weight, skinny, you know, all these things. Mm -hmm. um, but because that was so painful, I didn't eat and drink. I lost weight, but then I would become dehydrated. So I'd find myself back at MD Anderson getting pumped full of fluids, trying to figure out how to get rid of the mouth sores because certain chemos would cause the mouth sores. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I had kidney, I was going into kidney failure. I mean, just all kinds of stuff because of the type of cancer, they had to hit me hard and they hit me with the most aggressive chemo. And towards the end, it was the less aggressive stuff. And um, so all of this just combined, it was just hard. And I think one of the scariest moments throughout this whole journey was I woke up one morning and my motor skills were gone. Oh. And I asked my mom, I was able to, you know, do this and kind of, I need something to write. And she knew something was wrong with me as well. She, I was just mm -hmm. acting off. And probably like a five-year-old, I was able to real sloppy, because again, motor skills, you're writing, mm -hmm. write motor skills the best that I could, because I couldn't talk either. Mm -hmm. um, and she just knew something was wrong. She rushes me back to MD Anderson's ER and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm 
scared because I'm thinking, is this now me, right? Mm -hmm. Is this the Mm -hmm. new me? And if this is how, if this is what I'm going to be like, how am I going to take care of my two little girls? I'm not going to be able to care for them after this. So I'm really upset and worried that this might be permanent. Mm -hmm. So they bring in a neurologist and, um, you know, when you have kids and you're teaching them things, we usually start with flashcards. That uses mm-hmm. little flashcards with like a heart or a square or a house or a bird. He comes in and he starts showing me these flashcards to see if I know what they are. And I'm like, I know what they are. I just can't talk. So we eventually figured out nod. If, you know, he would lie to me and I'd have to catch him in his lie by nodding. Is this true? No, you're lying. And he realized, okay, nothing's wrong with her brain. Mm-hmm. I was on a chemo called methotrexate. And this is a little bit more towards the end of my treatment, mid mid to end. And methotrexate, when I would, that was an outpatient chemo. When I would take that chemo, in between chemos, I would have to take medicine to help flush it from my Mm -hmm. system because Mm -hmm. my numbers had to be a certain number before I could go back and get hit again. Well, come to find out, my body was just just not functioning right. It was slowing down. I wasn't able to flush the chemo as quickly. They had pretty much overdosed me on chemo. And so it was a... It was a simple fix, though. It was, Mm -hmm. they doubled me up on my medication. And within 24 hours, I was back to being able to speak and write. Um, But that was brilliant. Yes, that was probably one of the scariest moments. But because of that, you can see where my body is just, it's not doing well. You know, like I did chemo for a good year, maybe a little bit longer than a year. And I don't know if people realize that chemo is poison. It mm-hmm. kills the bad along with mm-hmm. the good. Um, mm-hmm. And so I knew with every being, I mean, in my heart, my gut, like everything in me was saying, you have got to stop chemo or it's going to kill you. And I remember, I remember my uncle because my uncle was diagnosed and had passed about 10 years before I found out I had cancer. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I remember hearing family members saying it wasn't cancer that killed him. It was the chemo that killed him. Oh, wow. And I just vividly remember that. And I'm like, if I don't end chemo, my outcome will be the exact same as my uncle. Right. Mm-hmm. So I was about two or three rounds from being complete, uh, completing my treatment plan. And I told my mom, I can't. It's killing me. And I was honestly afraid that if I just did one more round of chemo, sorry, (laughs) I would die. Yeah. All of of this fighting that I had done to save my daughter to fight for my life would would be wiped out, you know, for how hard I had been fighting to stay alive. And so I went to my doctor and I'm like, I'm done. You're Mm -hmm. killing me. My body Mm -hmm. cannot. Cannot handle one more round of chemo. And thankful he was, thankfully he was like, okay, Tracy, you're, you're not completely insane to make this decision. He had seen all the numbers. He knew my body was not doing well. Um, and he's like, and I've treated you a little bit longer than most. So he was, he could agree with my decision. It did, That's you know, good. Yeah, yeah, it did put me mm-hmm. at a little bit of a risk, but I'm like, take a little bit of a risk or die. Because I just knew I was going to die if I did anymore. Oh, wow. Hmm. Yeah. So I stopped chemo. And I always tell people when I tell people that, that I am not an advocate for going against what your doctors say. I don't preach, you know, defy your doctor. But I am a huge advocate to listen to your body and that nobody, Hmm. nobody knows your body better than you do. And obviously I've got, I've got my own proof. And so that is a skill that I've had to develop was I have gone against doctor's advice on several occasions throughout my life, but it was because in my gut, my intuition was telling me something wasn't right. And I chose to listen to that, which over time I built trust in my own intuition because listening to it proved to play out in my favor and I just learned to, to listen to that. So obviously keeping my daughter was the right choice. And in chemo early was the right choice. So I just want to make that clear. I'm not an advocate for mm-hmm. going Definitely. against yeah. your doctors. Yeah, yeah. But we have to trust ourselves and our body and have an open conversation. Mm-hmm. And also find doctors who will listen to you and don't act like they know everything. I have found that the best doctors will listen to you. And like I have a cardiologist right now and I was... Lord, when he said this, because of course he's at MD Anderson, which is a great place. 
And we're talking about certain things. And he's like, you know what, Tracy, you know your body better than I do. And I trust that you will tell me how these things make you feel. And like, that is a good doctor right there. Of yes, course, he's definitely. giving me his opinion. He's mm-hmm. telling me all the things. He's telling me how to do stuff. Mm-hmm. But when you're playing with medication dosage, he's like, you'll know. And you just let mm-hmm. me know how all this stuff is making you feel. Mm-hmm. So I just respect doctors like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, of course, it, it sounds like such a sad story in some ways. Um, but after, and I won't watch a movie that doesn't have a happy ending. If you're, if I'm going to watch a movie, it better have a happy ending or I get so upset. So a year after treatment, and I did file for divorce when I was sick. So I was going through divorce as well. Gosh. Can't make it up. But you you know what? And I always tell people, people would not mm. believe my story if I didn't mm. actually have family members who were in my along my journey with me who'd be like no that really happened because it does sound so made up it truly does and I get it Um, but a year after chemo was complete and I'm trying to get back to life and you know put myself into a world that I wasn't familiar with anymore because I cancer was my world for over a year I met a man and Mm -hmm. it was crazy I met him and we started dating instantly four weeks later he proposed I almost dumped him well, I almost dumped him. Well, okay, I did dump him, but then I got my ring back. But I was like, I thought that it was too good to be true. He seemed mm-hmm. like too good of a guy. I'd marry him. He changed. I'd be stuck. I'm not doing this. I'm a single mom. Like, this is mm-hmm. dumb. You just got divorced. But I realized that that was fear and not my intuition, something that I had already started develop- developing a trust for, right? And I'm like, okay, that's fear speaking. And I can tell that it's fear speaking. So I asked for my ring back. He gladly gave it back. And we got married just a couple months later. And he, so the thing with my ex-husband was he was an active teen father as well. When he left me, he pretty much was just out of the picture. Mm -hmm. Um, So I get married to my now husband, Ryan. He adopted my girls. Um, We added two more boys to our family. Yes, we are going on 19 years of marriage. And a lot of people Mm -hmm. ask, you know, I thought that, you know, when you have chemo, that it's hard to have children after. And I said, well, it is true for some. But Mm -hmm. fortunately, I was, we were able to go on and have two more children. So that is my happy ending to a crazy story. I don't know about the courageousness of it. I think that's short of a miracle. (laughs) Wow. What a story that you have lived. And I, for one, am so glad you listened to yourself and stopped you needed to listen to yourself and got better. So well done. I mean, well done doesn't sound good enough, but absolutely <laughs> proud of you. And I'm glad you're still here. And look, look at the life you've built. Wow. Thank you. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So, yes. So the next part of your journey, where do we start? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Because, <laughs> like, you're, you I know. know. You're doing so well. You're a motivational speaker and, you know, you've written your best-selling book. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So I became a speaker kind of by accident. Mm -hmm. Um, My aunt used to work for MD Anderson and they, I have also, I've done three speeches for them so far, um, Mm -hmm. three events, but she's like, you know, you have such an amazing story. I think that um, people would love to hear it. So it was an employee uh, event kind of thing and asked me to come speak for just five minutes. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I am not a speaker at this point. Like five minutes sounds terrible. What am I going to say? Everyone's looking at me, but I couldn't say no to a hospital that Mm -hmm. saved my life. And I'm like, I Mm -hmm. owe it to them. I need to show some appreciation. I can do this. It was hard, but I'm like, I can do this. So I, I know I do a five minute speech. And something just lit a fire in me. And it, it wasn't about me. I wanted it to be about them. I wanted yes. them to know what all of their sacrifice and long hours had done in my life and how appreciative I was and how selfish it would be of me to not go on and live a great life. Mm. And, and almost giving almost in giving thanks to them. You know, mm-hmm. like how could I not go on and and and, and just live my best life? after everything I've been through. So it was kind of more of that speech. I wanted them to feel good. Not, it wasn't so much sharing my story as much as like, how can I make them feel good for what they do? Um, And they loved it. And then I got asked Mm -hmm. to do like a 15 minute speech. And again, same thing, loved (laughs) it. Then it turned into a 30 minute speech for, you know, retirees. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay. 
And then I just thought, you know, but along the way, the thing with my cancer story is it was very traumatic. It was the hardest thing I've ever gone through. Absolutely. And I couldn't speak about it. For years, mm -hmm. I couldn't speak about it because I was so traumatized. I didn't even know where to start. And honestly, the way I wanted to deal with it was brush it under a rug and act like it didn't happen. I wanted to act like it didn't happen. Move forward. Don't talk about it. Well, you learn when you try to, to do that, that it doesn't work. And I learned <laughs> that I had to own my story yes, so that definitely. I could heal, so mm -hmm. that I could move forward. And my parents were always telling me, you need to talk about it. Your story will help so many people. And I'm mm -hmm. like... Um, I mean, what am I, like, what do y'all know? Like, of course it's easy for you to say that. Like, you know, you weren't the one really going through it. Yeah, but yeah. it's true that the more you talk about something, mm. um, the less power it has over you, the more control Absolutely. you take, take back, mm. but you also start to heal. And so I just started like volunteering for certain things at, you know, in the cancer community, giving speeches and really one thing just led into a next. And so that's really where the speaking journey started. And that's honestly what I share on, you know, when I guess, you know, on podcast, because everyone is so drawn to that story. I've written, you know, articles and they mm -hmm. always do so well. And I've tested the waters. I've put other things out there and people don't care about it. But for some <laughs> reason, people love to hear my story. And so that's what my book is, is it's sharing my story, but it's also about every chapter is about a struggle that I have mm -hmm. had in my life. You know, I'm a woman, I'm a wife, I'm a mom. So if you have thought it or gone through it or dealt with it, I probably have too. I have dealt with so many things. Um, I tried committing suicide when I was a teenager and I talk about that in my book, you know, there's just so much stuff, but I don't just like share my life, right? Mm -hmm. I give tangible tips and tools. I created, a, I, I call it the upstruggle formula uh, mm -hmm. about how to recognize, I, 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 through research, I realized that there were three universal struggles that everybody will go through. And I talk about those because you have to be able to identify your struggle to know how you're going to deal with it because they are a little different. And then I give seven reminders of things that people can do to help them struggle better because I truly believe that if you have a heart and if you're human, you will have struggles throughout your life. They're different for mm -hmm. all of us, Yes. but they won't just go away because we don't like them. They're not just going to mm -hmm. go away because mm -hmm. you make good money. They don't just go away because you're a good person. If you're human, you will have struggles. And so I realized that and I'm like, okay, these aren't going to go away because I truly thought, right, as wise as I was, I thought, oh, if I start making better choices and I become a better mm -hmm. person, I will have no struggle. Mm -hmm. Wrong. And so because <laughs> of that, that everything I had, it does not work that way. And because of everything I'd gone through, I really wanted to dive into the research of struggles and reflecting. And that's how I came about with my formula. And so every chapter, you know, talking about working, motherhood, just everything and the struggles that I've gone through and oopsies that I've made. Um, some are funny. Some will make you cry. You know, um, there's always something, a tip that I give to help because I didn't want to write a book that was just about my story, about my life. Yes. I really I wanted to mm -hmm. share my experiences mm -hmm. and my struggles with people to see what I had been through. But look what I learned. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can use these same tips and tools next time you're struggling. So that's really, really what the, the book is about. That's excellent. Yeah, definitely. You use your TikTok to help various courses and have 670 followers. Tell me more about that, Tracy. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm not new to social media. Mm -hmm. I think I got on, God, I think I got on Facebook. I just checked in like, oh, nine. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a long time ago. Yes. Um, but TikTok was new and what a lot of people did in 2020 is we made a TikTok account because we had nothing to do, right? And so we <laughs> turned to social media. So in um, 2020, I made a TikTok account. It was early 2020, probably March or April. And because I, I know how social media works, I know how like the type of content to put out, my mm -hmm. account did good right away. My videos did That's good. Right. I started building a following right away. Um, and I think I was at like 50,000 followers. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like the easiest thing. But I didn't just like dance because it, it really was a lot of dancing when I got on. <laughs> I didn't just dance. I would dance or do something funny in the background, but I would have like an uplifting message mm. over it so that one, I could catch people's eye by the dancing, but that there was a message to go with it. And so I just started doing that. And I realized that People just liked my content over there. So I spent mm -hmm. time over there. And I'm all about lifting others up. 
I love putting mm -hmm. stuff out there that's thought provoking, inspiring, um, stuff like that. And in April on Good Friday, I went to Wendy's and I don't ever go to Wendy's, but I was a little girl. I always went and I would do the frosty and the fries. You get the fries, you dip it in the chocolate frosty. I know it sounds weird, but it's a sweet, salty <laughs> thing. And me and my husband are out running errands and I'm telling him about this story, what I used to do. And I'm like, you know what? Let's, let's, I want to relive that. Take me to Wendy's. Mm. like, okay. We go to Wendy's and let's just be real. A majority of fast food workers, unless you're at Chick-fil-A, aren't always upbeat and happy to greet you, you know? Um, so I, we put our order in and the other person taking my order was so, but it was so genuine and sincere, just joyful. That was a word that came to me, joyful. And I'm thinking, I'm taken back. Like, what? This, I, this is, it was, and it's sad to say that that's rare and that would, that would make you stop to think, but it, it is rare. And as my, again, my intuition said, you need to record him. I'm like, that mm. is weird. I'm not the weird person who goes around recording people. That's just not me. But it kept nudging me. You need mm. to record him. You need to record him. I'm like, fine, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. So I get my phone out and my husband's driving. So I have to lean across and I'm like, I just have to record you and, you know, show everyone all your joy. So he knew I was recording him. But it was like a 20 second or 27 second video. Mm -hmm. I post it to Facebook. It did pretty good. A hundred likes, handful of comments, couple shares. I was like, okay. I just sat on it. Didn't think much of it. Fast forward to August of 2020. And the thought came to me, you know that video of the Wendy's mm -hmm. guy? You should put that on TikTok. I didn't spend hardly any time editing. I threw up, I think, a caption that said, choose joy. If this doesn't make you smile, nothing will. And I went to bed. Like, it took me 10 seconds to do. I wake up. And that video just took off and people were commenting, do the Venmo challenge, do the Venmo challenge. Now the Venmo challenge is where you raise money for a cause or for someone. Yes. And usually it's because someone is sick or they're mm -hmm. homeless. It's usually for something mm -hmm. like that. But mm -hmm. you have to think this was in 2020 when the negative news, the world's upside down, everyone's scared. And there's this video of just joy people were drawn to it. I think people wanted that. We raised in one week, just over $40,000, not wow. because he was sick, not because he needed mm. it, simply because of how joyful he was on a 27 mm. second video. So then I'm thinking, okay, and I built a platform that just launched my platform. And mm -hmm. I'm like, so then I felt a duty. I've done it. I've got people's eyes. Like I, I just feel like if you have a platform, you should give back in some way, you know, mm -hmm. um, and shouldn't just make it all about you. And so I'm like, okay, let's do this again. And I see another video and instantly I'm like, I want to do it for him. So the second one that we did where we raised almost $90,000 in one week wow. was Great. for a guy named, a guy named Rodney. He needed heart mm -hmm. surgery or would mm -hmm. die. And he's a dad of two kids. The problem is when you have that serious of a heart problem, it's hard to work. If you can't work, you can't have insurance. If you don't Absolutely. have insurance, people mm -hmm. don't want to operate on you. I know it's sad, mm -hmm. but it's the reality, right? Mm -hmm. So I go live and I ask my community, do you think we can do this? And instantly they're like, yes, we've already seen the video. We wanted you to do this. Let's do it. So we did it for him. He got his heart surgery. He's able to be a father to his two kids and he's living a normal life. And you know, those are big things. Those are big amounts. I did go on to, you know, raise five grand here, two, three grand here and give it out and stuff. Um, but then something, I wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. And so I created something called the wishlist wipeout. Mm. And I started that over on TikTok where I got about 13 other creators. I mean, between us creators, there was millions of millions of millions of followers between us 13. Oh, no. And mm -hmm. so we all picked an organization to donate to. So what we did, the reason I called it Wishlist Wipeout was because on mm -hmm. Amazon, you create a wish list. Mm -hmm. Then we wanted our community to wipe it out. So why not wish list wipe out? And so if you guys yes. uh, look up the hashtag over there, you'll see, I think some other people have done some, taken on, you know, that and done it themselves, mm -hmm. but I was the one who created it and it was a really big thing over there. And so we all did it, picked the organization and had our community buy the mm -hmm. product. Um, I do a whole story, right? Cause people love stories. Stories are what connect. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm taking my followers on the journey. I'm doing a video of who we're choosing. I'm doing a video of wrapping it. I'm doing a video like I'm showing them. Also, it builds trust that when you mm-hmm. say you're going to do something, you need to follow through. And they know that you're not just keeping the gift. You're not just keeping the money, but you're actually giving it away to who you say you're going to. So I built trust over there with my, my uh, community. Mm-hmm, um, and mm-hmm. so that was something that we did over there. It was really nice just to yeah. do that one for Christmas. It was, it was a Christmas gift back. And so that's what we did over there. That's the Wishless Life Out. Well, that's brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. You really are doing some superb work. And, oh, that's brilliant. I mean, you know, you. need more people like you, Tracy. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I think I just, I have a hard time. If I can help somebody. Yes. And I can use my platform or mm-hmm. write a book to help people to struggle better, mm-hmm. or better or be the host of a podcast that, you know, is all about spreading kindness mm-hmm. so that people, because, you know, I really believe that, like, what we focus on grows. And yes. I, I used to watch the news years ago. I don't really mm-hmm. don't watch it anymore. The only time I'll watch really? it is if there's a hurricane in the Gulf mm-hmm. and I need to see if we're going to get hit. And then I'm watching it really close. Other than that, I don't watch it because it made me feel bad and scared and scarcity and fear and all these things Mm -hmm. and I didn't like it. And Mm -hmm. so why not have a podcast that is centered on kindness and push that out? You know, I was doing a test um, for something the other day and I was reminded of this. And she said, as humans, we have 60,000 thoughts a day. That is a Mm -hmm. lot of thoughts. Mm -hmm. And about 75% are negative. What? Out of 60,000 thoughts a day, 75% are negative. Do you think that the negative people on social media help? Do you think that the negative news helps that? Oh my gosh, no wonder we have a mental health crisis, right? Yes. So can I just do my mm-hmm. part and push good stuff? And that's what the Rocket Kindness Podcast is about. Mm-hmm. You know, I always tell people, I didn't call it the Kindness Podcast. It's Rock Your Kindness because I yes. believe, and it's, and this was a hashtag that I started on TikTok mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. I started doing all these give backs. Mm-hmm. I wanted to have a, a personal hashtag to link to all the stuff that me and my community was doing. And I just came up with Rock Your Kindness. I'm like, that's kind of catchy. That's kind of cute. But when it, yeah, and it now the podcast two years later, yeah. right? But and that was my that, next question. That was my next question to you because you are the host of Rock Your Kindness. And I was going to say, loving the title, but carry Thank on. You. Well, so it's the reason why is because I truly believe that we all show up in our own unique way in this world Mm -hmm. to give kindness. And so Mm -hmm. it's rock your kindness. We are, Mm -hmm. we are sharing stories of things that people are doing. So it's all kinds from adoption to charity, Mm -hmm. to some social media stuff, to all kinds of different stories of how they are showing up in their own unique way, spreading kindness, you know? So, uh, that's, it was just amazing how you start a hashtag and then two years later, mm-hmm. and it is, it is presented by Love What Matters um, mm-hmm. and how some people are also like, well, how did, how did Love What Matters reach out to you um, to ask you to be the host? So I was a writer for Love What Matters for several years okay. yeah. and the founder, Colin, wanted to start a new podcast and he asked his team for a recommendation and they mentioned my name. Mm-hmm. And that's how it got started. And, you know, Love What Matters is a storytelling platform. And their focus is on overcoming obstacles, mm-hmm. empathy, and hope. They have 8 million followers on Facebook. And their reach every single month is 40 million. So wow. this is how Colin is mm-hmm. rocking his kindness, which, by the way, he, he will be my first guest to talk about more of what Love What Matters is and mm-hmm. stuff. Um, that's how he's showing up. And I, Mm. you know, the story isn't out there too much, but I think it's really important for people to know how Love What Matters got started. So Colin is the baby of three brothers. I can relate to being the baby because I'm the baby of four, of there's four of us girls. And he is the most sensitive um, of the boys. And his mother actually had cancer as well. She had a conversation with him saying, you know, you're the most sensitive. This is going to be harder on you because they knew she would pass. Mm-hmm. This is going to be hard on you, but you need to take that pain and you need to turn it into something good. Mm-hmm. So that is how he started Love What Matters and just the, the reach and the impact that it has. And now, you know, we're expanding that brand and I'm the first podcast. So it's just amazing how 
things start off small or things can start from what just feels devastating. And mm-hmm. we really can choose mm-hmm. to yes. make it and turn it into something good. Um, yeah. So that's what the podcast is about. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I think we people, so we're really oh. excited about it. Yeah, that's brilliant. So what resources do you recommend, tools, daily tips to anyone that wants to fully embrace their life and live it? Oh, man. Get real with yourself. Mm. One, own who you are. Don't change who you are or don't change who you into someone you think you should be to please yes. others to do the thing. I really think to, to show up and live your life authentically that you have to be just that, authentic. And so, and that took me a while, you know, Mm where we've got so many mixed messages coming at us, do this, Mm -hmm. do that, don't do this, this is right, this is wrong. It's like, what's the (laughs) truth, right? And that's where I believe we all have that internal compass that I was talking about that I use to make my own decisions, even if it's Mm -hmm. the opposite of what doctors say, we are all gifted that internal compass. Mm -hmm. And we have to develop that skill to listen to it. And I truly believe that when we develop that skill to listen to it, that, that that compass will never lead you astray. You may not un- always understand why you felt compelled to do the thing, say the thing, but you'll, I've, I've never been led astray. So be authentic, learn, yes. learn to develop that skill of trusting your internal compass. Something I learned about being authentic is it's a filter, right? Mm-hmm. It is a filter that what you put out there will bring mm-hmm. in a type of people you want to surround yourself with. So oh, why sure. put something out there that you're not? Because then you're going to start attracting the things you don't want mm-hmm. when, and it can be scary. And I get that showing up as yourself, but it really, it really does change so much. And it, it's, it's a journey. It's a journey yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. So where can the listeners find your book online? What's your website, Tracy? Very easy. It's just tracyfarron.com. Uh, my book is on Amazon. Thankfully, just They'll come right to your doorstep. And then with the podcast, anywhere that a podcast that you can listen to, they can mm-hmm. they can listen to the podcast as well. Thank you for sharing your courageous journey with us today. And by doing so, you have helped so many others. Tracy Ferrin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And in the show notes, all the links will be there. So people go ahead, buy the book listen to the podcast and connect with Tracy. We are all about create the courage to be fearless. So what is your definition of courage? Oh, okay. And that's, I'm, I'm telling you, I really, I really put some thought into this. Um, so to me, courage is feeling the fear and allowing love to move you through it and doing the thing anyway. You know, it's kind of like we talk about my story. Mm-hmm. I knew the risk, but I let the love for my child mm-hmm. and my and my and my trusting my intuition. I allow that to move me through what I was being told with heart in all aspects of life, including the workspace. It, it should not be taken out of the workspace. Um, it's being authentic and putting yourself out there, knowing that you will be criticized. It's standing up for what you believe in to be right when everybody around you tells you that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's listening to your own intuition over the experts or the noise of the world. 